Good day and welcome to COTK Online. My name is Sharma Rai now. I'm the online campus pastor here at Church of the King. And it is my absolute honor and privilege to be with you online today. Now, if you're watching us for the very first time, the millionth time, or the very, very, very first time that someone sent you this link, I want to say thank you so much for joining us. In a moment, we're going to have an amazing word. But before we get into that, we want to invite you to get connected into our spiritual family. Transformation does not just happen in a one-time event, but it happens through relationships. And we want to equip you with relationships to help you grow in your walk with God. So why don't you hit the connect button in our description box down below or in the comments right now. And then we want to say thank you for each and every one of you that give. Because of your generosity, we get to make an impact in a world bigger than our own. Right now, with the conflicts happening overseas, we get to partner with organizations and people that make a difference on the ground. And that's because of your generosity, that we get to be God's kingdom in his hands and feet where we are most needed. So thank you so much for giving. And that's all from me. Pastor Todd is continuing on with week two of our sermon series called Kingdom Culture. Welcome to COTK Online. It is great to be with you today as we are in week two of Kingdom Culture. My heart for you in this series is that you recognize God's call on our life to pray that his kingdom come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's scripture. That's when Jesus' closest followers were asked, how do we pray? Teach us how to pray, Jesus. That's what he says. You know the prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that's such a powerful prayer because we know one thing. In our world today, we are not living in heaven. But we're called to pray that God's kingdom come. And his will's done on earth just like it is in heaven. So the kingdom of heaven to come to earth, which is so fitting when we read Jesus' words in the Gospels where over and over he talks about the kingdom of heaven. And for us, we, we are called to see, to recognize that there's a practical application of God's kingdom coming to life in our world, heaven coming down to this earth. The practical application is the foundation stone that we see in our church, the scripture that God gave us in Isaiah 58, 12, that says, those from among you will rebuild the ancient ruins. You'll raise up the age-old foundations. You'll be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of the streets in which to dwell because we're called to rebuild, to raise up, to repair and restore. That's what we're called to because if our faith doesn't have a practical outplaying, it's a failure of faith and it's simply a belief that we hold maybe near and dear but not so close to our heart where we have faith that it affects how we act because at the end of the day, the kingdom of God is one of action and power, not passive thought and talk. So we're going to jump into the story of Nehemiah today. Last week, we talked about Ezra and how the city of Jerusalem had been destroyed by the kingdom of Babylon and the captives, so many, the vast majority of Israelis had been taken captive and brought to Babylon. But then we saw the fulfillment of the prophetic word, God speaking through the prophet Jeremiah, who years before decades before had prophesied that though Jerusalem was going to lie in ruins and its people were taken away after a 70-year period, they would come back. And that's what we looked at last week in the book of Ezra. And this week, I want us to look in the book of Nehemiah, as Nehemiah is also in Babylon, and he is called to go back back to Jerusalem to rebuild. See, the kingdom of God is something that we are called to, to see come that kingdom that's in heaven come down to earth, and there's practical application. So let's look at the book of Nehemiah. Chapter 1, verse 1. It says, These are the memoirs of Nehemiah of Hakaliah. In late autumn in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes' reign, I was at the fortress of Susa. And this is Nehemiah writing. 
Hanai, one of my brothers, came to visit me with some other men who had just arrived from Judah. They had gone back to begin the rebuilding process. I asked them about the Jews who had returned there from captivity and about how things were going in Jerusalem. And they said to me, things are not going well for those who return to the province of Judah. They're in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down. The gates have been destroyed by fire. And when I heard this, I sat down and wept. In fact, for days I mourned, fasted, and prayed to the God of heaven. There's principles about understanding what the kingdom of God is really about. We know this, there's not going to be any tears in heaven. We know that there's the river of life, that the presence of God is there, that there's perfect peace and joy and unity and harmony. This is clearly not our world. Our world is broken and messed up and and we're called to be the ones who 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 rebuild who raise up who repair who restore but how do we get to that place this is what i want us to know it's three simple things then in the kingdom of god in god's kingdom number one when you hear of brokenness it moves you what happens when you hear of the brokenness that's happening on the other side of the world you just like uh okay swipe on that article What happens when you hear of somebody whose marriage has gone down the tubes or somebody who's lost a kid? You're like, wow, that's really terrible. I'll pray for you. But are we genuinely moved? Because in the kingdom of God, when God's kingdom is our our focus, when we hear of brokenness, it moves us. We look at the book of Nehemiah and Nehemiah is still in Babylon, but he hears the report of Jerusalem, that the walls are broken down, that the city's been burned, and it, it, it moves him. He's, it says he mourns. Like, when you hear of brokenness, what does it move you to? Here's what it should move us to. If we have a heart to see God's kingdom come and his will be done in a broken world, it's going to move us first to pain. When we hear of brokenness, we empathize, we sense, we feel that pain. As I've watched what's happening in Israel, as as October 7th unfolded, and I'm watching the videos of what took place, cell phone footage, I can't tell you how many times since October 7th, I've been by myself watching that, broken, literally crying and praying. Because when we hear of brokenness, it should move us to pain, but it should also move us to prayer because prayer is supremely powerful. It's us petitioning, knocking on the door of heaven, knowing that God hears us and that we are praying for the brokenness. Look at what Nehemiah does. When I heard this, I sat down and he wept. He was in pain. For days I mourned. He fasted and he prayed. When you hear of brokenness, what does it move you to? Does it move you to change the channel, to turn off the TV, to swipe the article away? Or does it move you to the place of pain where you're going to pray, where you're going to fast? Does it move you to the place of purity? It does for Nehemiah. Look at at verse 5. It says, Then I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of unfailing love with those who love him and obey his commandments. Listen to my prayer. Look down and see me praying night and day for your people Israel. Look at what he says, though. He says, I confess that we have sinned against you. Yes, even my own family and I have sinned. We've sinned terribly by not obeying the commands, decrees, and the regulations that you gave us through your servant Moses. He's praying a prayer of purity because when we hear of brokenness, it should break our heart. It should drive us to prayer, but it should drive us to the place of purity where he's confessing his own sin, but he's also confessing the sin of his family and of his nation and his people. Do I take on the sins of my nation? Well, that's how can I do that? There's a biblical mandate for us to to confess the sins of the nation that we live in and ask God to move and, and bring the brokenness of our nation to the place of healing by his hand and by ours, because we all should be motivated, not just to the place where we feel the pain, not just to the place of prayer, not just to the place of of purity, but to recognize that we have a purpose. See, Nehemiah 
when he heard of the brokenness, and this is the kingdom of God. Now remember, Jerusalem's in ruins. Ezra's, they're already there, and they're people that are starting to rebuild. They're, they rebuilt the altar. They're laying the foundation for the temple, but the city itself is in ruins. Nehemiah hears of this. He's grieved. He fasts. He prays. He mourns. He confesses his sin, and then he realizes he has a part to play, and he has a purpose to bring healing and wholeness. We all do. We are all called to action in some form or fashion. Turns out, Nehemiah wasn't just a somebody who was Israeli and in Babylon in captivity. He had one of the most trusted positions in the entire kingdom. He was the cupbearer to King Artaxerxes. It was a very trusted position. That meant that he was to make sure that the food that the king ate was not poisoned, was not spoiled, And he had a very, very important, prestigious, and trusted position. And this is what Nehemiah decides. He says, grant me success by making the king favorable to me. Put it into his heart to be kind to me. That's chapter 1. It's the very end of chapter 1. It says, in those days, I was the king's cupbearer. He makes a decision to ask the king if he can go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the city walls and put up the gates so that it is safe and secure. He's also very nervous about this request of the king because the king has the authority to have him banished, fired, or executed. Now remember, Nehemiah is just devastated because he hears of the brokenness. When you hear of brokenness, Are you in the place of being just devastated so much so that it drives you to prayer, to purity, and to step out into your God-given purpose to make a difference in the world around you? That's where Nehemiah was. And and he knows that, that he can't hide that sorrow in front of the king, but it was illegal to be sorrowful and to be sad in the presence of the king. Nobody was allowed to do that. And if they were, he could have them executed. And yet Nehemiah goes before the king and the king says, why are you sad? And Nehemiah says, how can I not be? When my Jerusalem is in destruction, it's in ruins. And he petitions the king to let him go back and rebuild the walls and hang the gates. And the king says yes. In chapter 2, this is what we see, starting with verse 11. He's arrived in Jerusalem. It says, So I arrived in Jerusalem, and three days later I slipped out during the night, taking only a few others with me. I had not told anyone about the plans God had put in my heart for Jerusalem. We took no pack animals with us except the donkey I was riding. And after dark, I went through the valley gate just past the jackal's well and over to the dung gate to inspect the broken walls and the burned gates. Then I went to the fountain gate and to the king's pool, but my donkey couldn't get through the rubble. So though it was still dark, I went up the Kidron Valley instead, inspecting the wall before I turned back and entered again at the valley gate. And the city officials didn't know that I had been out there or what I was doing, for I had not yet said anything to anyone about my plans. I had not yet spoken to the Jewish leaders, the priests, the nobles, the officials, or anyone else in the administration. So what did he do? He went out on a reconnaissance mission to see how bad the destruction was. He had heard about it, but now he sees firsthand. What do you do when you hear about brokenness? What do you do when you see it firsthand? Hmm. Verse 17, after he's gone on his reconnaissance mission, he goes back to the Jewish leaders and he says this, Now I said to them, you know very well what trouble we're in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire. Let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and end this disgrace. Then I told them about how the gracious hand of God had been on me and about my conversation with the king. And they replied at once, yes, let's rebuild the wall. So they began the good work. When you hear about brokenness, it should, it should move you to the place of sorrow that drives you to prayer and purity. But in it, you see that you have a purpose, you have a call, and God can use you to rebuild. And then this is what Nehemiah does, but when he sees the destruction, it motivates him 
to action. It sets him in motion. When you see brokenness, does it set you in motion or do you just sit back and expect somebody else to do something with the brokenness of the world around you? Because as believers, we are called to rebuild. We're called to raise up. We're called to repair and restore. So when we see brokenness, when we hear about it, it should drive us to prayer from our pain and to purity and purpose. But when we see it, it should set us in motion to know that we are called to make a difference in the world around us. That's what we're called to. That's what our church is called to. That's what I'm called to. That's what you're called to. We each have our role to play. And as you read through the book of Nehemiah, I hope that you do, because every family that was there that had gone back, those 42,360 people from last week, if you watch the message, or if you read the book of Ezra, they, they had camped all around Jerusalem, and each family was responsible for rebuilding the wall that was right in front of them. They were able to see, not just hear, they had heard about the destruction of Jerusalem. That's why they went back. And then when they get there, they see the walls knocked down, the gates burned with fire. But Nehemiah rallies them and says, let's rebuild. Let's rebuild. And they do. They were set in motion. I got a question. I got, I got a, this. All of this brings up sup, such questions for me. Does the church do a good job at seeing the broken, letting it break their heart, drive them to prayer and purpose? When they hear of brokenness, does, does it grieve them? When they see it, does the church act on it? Well, the church isn't a building and it's not an organization. It's people. And so at the end of the day, I have to answer that question as me being the church. And so do you. When you hear of somebody who's walking through brokenness, when you see somebody who's in brokenness, what do you do? What do you do? Because the answer to that question of what will I do when I hear of brokenness, if it doesn't break your heart, you need a heart check. If it doesn't drive you to prayer, what does it drive you to? Are you just apathetic? When you see it, does it set you in motion towards the problem, towards the difficulty, towards the, the brokenness? Or do you, do you step back and expect somebody else to handle it? Well, that's for the church to handle. You are the church. You are the church. That's the thing, like, I need to call the church. And, and, and oh, no, we are the church. We, we are called to help those in brokenness. We are called to be in motion. If our prayer really is, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When we see brokenness, we also see opportunity. Opportunity. Those from among you. Not those from among the church. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, okay, who's that? Where's the church? Let's call the leaders of the church to get this. We're the leaders in the church. You are. You know, everybody has a calling on their life. It's not just pastoral staff. It's not just a worship leader or somebody who works with kids. We all have a calling to see the kingdom of God, just like in heaven, come down to earth. And my prayer for you, number one, in the areas where you're broken, you invite the kingdom of God. You invite Jesus himself to come and bring healing and wholeness. And then when you see it in others, you get it here and you step out and you act. What will you be? I love the book of Nehemiah. What was Nehemiah? Sensitive to the heart of God. Sensitive to the heart of God. One of the things that's just been reverberating inside of me is pray first. Pray first. You never know what's on the other side of your obedience when you step out first in prayer. That's the first thing that Nehemiah did when he heard. Does it say, I sat down and wept. That was the first thing. He wept. It broke his heart. I mourned. I fasted and prayed. Just pray with people and then practically help them. So here's my question. Are you going to operate in faith knowing that God can bring healing to you and that God is going to bring healing and wholeness through you? 
Are you going to operate in fear that you can't do anything, that you can't, you can't be, you can't get better, you can't be healed, you can't be whole, you can't help others? You, mm, faith or fear? God's called us to trust Him, not just with our healing, but with our hands that He's going to use to bring about His kingdom. But it takes surrender. And I pray that your heart's surrendered. I pray that this week, that you step out of your comfort zone and you step into the kingdom of God by helping somebody who's encountered the brokenness of this world. And you bring them to the place of hope and life and peace because you've experienced that through Jesus. And maybe this is touching your heart right now and you know that You need to grow in faith and trust God to bring healing to you and trust God to bring healing through you. And so if that's you, I want to pray for you. Father, I just pray for those that are listening. Lord, that if they've never surrendered to you, that they they surrender their own sin and brokenness and they, they put it at your feet of Jesus, at the foot of the cross, and they receive your forgiveness. Father, I just pray that that you you let them know that You've got their number. You know them. Right now, if that's you and you just sense the Holy Spirit at work and you just pray and say, Dear Jesus, I turn from my sin. I receive your forgiveness. Cleanse me. And maybe, maybe you're here and you know you've not been stepping out in faith. You've been the person that swipes off the article or drives by the person on the side of the road that needs help or ignores the the lady that's struggling at Walmart and you feel prompted just on a little tug to go help, I pray that you step out. If that's you, I want to pray. Father, I just pray for those that know that they're called to action, to bring wholeness to those that are broken. Use them, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Love you guys. Let's go be the church. I pray that that's what we can be, the hands and the feet of Jesus, to bring healing and hope to the world. Love y'all. See you next week. God bless.